Without further ado, I'd like to give it to Saf and he will present the topic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahmatullahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhi nastafa wa ala alihi wa sahabati wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-jaza wa ba'd. Ayyuhal ikhwa, inna rabbakum amarakum an tusallimu ala habibihi inna Allah wa malaikatu yusallun ala al-Nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا. just to uh, of course as we always before we begin all praise all complete and worthy praise belongs to our all loving sovereign Lord the Creator of the universe Allah سبحانه وتعالى countless blessings salutations greetings upon the best of creation the one whom Allah loves more than anyone and anything, the one whom we love more than anyone and anything, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his pure family, his noble companions, the tabi'een and all those who follow them until the last day. Of course we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well for bringing us here this evening and we hope that Allah accepts this amal from us on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and makes it heavy on the scales. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. Just to mention the not the hero, but the heroine, the, uh, the lady hero of our topic. Now, of course, over the couple of the last few weeks, you've been listening to many heroes in Islam. Most of them perhaps have been men. Amrijal, men whom Allah blessed with knowledge and piety and uh, a very thorough and pious life. And today, I think it is... And maybe it's our fault as well, we don't talk about the women in Islamic history who have contributed to our civilization enough. And one person today who we want to talk about very briefly because the information about her life is very scant, um, but nevertheless it's necessary. And this is uh, Fatima al-Fihri, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her. Has it, can anyone put their hand up? Uh, can they tell me, have you heard of Fatima al-Fihri? Yes. I think that's the general response. No one knows who she is. No one knows who she is. But inshallah, maybe today we can shed some light on this person. Um, and really to draw out the lessons from her uh, to our own lives. To our own lives. And what we can do as people now here, uh, learning lessons from her life. So. Without delay, let's just go then to very briefly about her biography of her life. Like I said, there's not much available. Definitely in English, French, maybe Spanish, there's not a, uh, in the secondary languages, there's nothing available. I did try to look in as many Arabic sources as I could in the short time, but I wasn't able to find anything with lengthy biographical detail of her life. But anyway, uh, Fatima was the daughter of a man called Muhammad bin Abdullah al-Fihri al-Qairawani. There's a man, a very wealthy man, a very rich man called Muhammad al-Fihri. He was from Tunisia, originally in the city of Qairawan in Tunisia. And Muhammad al-Fihri, he was a very successful businessman, a merchant. And, uh, you know, he had a very high social nobility. He was a very uh, high status in society. Some say they were a kind of a royal family. So Fatima, on that interpretation, would be a princess. So some biographies do say she's a princess. So she could be royalty. But most of them say she was of a very high social ladder. You know, like, maybe like from Chelsea, maybe in London somewhere here. For some, you know, someone who's from a posh, upper-class Arab family. So she was from originally Tunisia and then of course her father being a successful businessman you know, migrated like many Arabs did from Tunisia they migrated west to Morocco from Tunisia we're talking about maybe about eight, eight, 800 to about 880 that period of time yeah the second and the third century Hijri in Islam yeah so this man Muhammad al-Fihri he migrated west towards Morocco 
you know, maybe to expand the family business, you know, to look up, to look for more ways to open up business. And he took his daughter Fatima and his other daughter Maryam. So he had two, two daughters, Fatima and Maryam. And he educated them both. They were very young, very um, strong personality people. He educated them. They had one of the top educations at that time. And he brought them up in the Islamic education where Fatima and her sister Maryam, they both learn the Islamic sciences, the traditional Islamic sciences, the traditional uloom. Can anyone put their hand up? Do they, do they know what one of the traditional Islamic sciences might be? One of the traditional subjects they used to study in Islam? Does, could anyone say what one of them might be? Okay, the, the study of hadith, definitely. Definitely that was part of the uh, early syllabus in Islam. Any other subject? Anyone might have a guess? Okay, usul fiqh, fiqh, yes, study law, Islamic law. See, all Muslims, we have to study uh, every action that we do every day. All the actions that you do every day, go to the toilet, you wash yourself, uh, you pray. All these things, you have a job. Whatever it is, you have to know the ahkam, the Islamic ruling on that issue. Yep, fiqh, anything else? Quran, tafsir. Yeah, they have to study tafsir. They have to study, of course, the Arabic language as well. So Fatima and Maryam, they both grew up under the, uh, this kind of Islamic umbrella education. They learned the traditional Islamic sciences and they became very pious women, pious young women. So they traveled with their father from Tunisia to Morocco to a city called Fez or Fez. In Morocco. Some of you may have even been to that part, the northwest part of Morocco. So that city had different districts or quarters and their father moved to the uh, western district of Fes. Okay, so these two girls now went with their father who's very rich, he's very high status and they both then now settled in that part of Morocco. So after they settled in there these two young girls, even from before when they were studying, they always had this desire to uh, support anything Islamic, especially architecture, especially architecture. Maybe some of you may even be interested in architecture, designing buildings and structures. So these, the mosque that you see, the buildings that you see, it came from someone. Someone thought about a concept design. They had a, an idea in their head how to design that building. These two girls, Fatima and Maryam, these two sisters, they were very interested in Islamic architecture, to sponsor, and they always had a dream and a desire to do something like that, like to build a mosque or an Islamic center or institution. So as soon as they reached, you know, the, the, that town in Morocco, they settled in, time went by, and they didn't spend their time idly, not doing anything. They didn't spend their time just putting their feet up saying, yeah, we're rich, we've got all the money, have a little tea party in the garden, things like that. No, they were people who were always thinking about the community. How can I make my community better? I'm in this new community now. What is it that my community doesn't have? What is it that they're lacking? Okay, so lacking school. That part of Morocco where they settled, didn't have schools, developed schools. Okay, how can I make schools? They didn't have a huge mosque, so the Muslims can gather, come together, talk, you know, discuss. And that's what a mosque is supposed to be for. If you go to a big mosque, you see many people come, sit down, just to, you know, talk to each other. It's like a little social thing after the salah. Maybe some of you have even been to a big mosque. And, uh, you know, seeing people just come together, sit down, and get to know each other and discuss about uh, problems in the community or community affairs. So, Fatima and her sister, Maryam, they decided, how can we make our community, our locality, better? How can we improve it? And so after her father passed away, after their father passed away, Muhammad al-Fihri, after he passed away, because he was a rich man, he left them a lot of inheritance, a lot of money. A lot of money. Once these sisters got money, what did they do? Did they get on a yacht or a boat and start partying? No. 
No, with that money, because they were brought up Islamically, with that money, straight away they thought, now's our time to realize our dream. The dream that we've always wanted to build a kind of center or a mosque and sponsor the building of a mosque where people can come and pray and learn. Where people can come and pray and learn Islamic knowledge. They can do ibadah, worship, and they can learn knowledge. So their father left them a huge sum of money. Huge sum of money. The, the sources don't tell us exactly how much, but it was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. So both of them began to realize their dream. Maryam, Fatima al-Fihri's sister, Maryam al-Fihri, she sponsored the building of the mosque in Fez uh, called the Al-Andalus Mosque. So her sister sponsored that. And then Fatima al-Fihri sponsored the construction of the mosque, which she named after her town, her city in Tunisia, Al-Qarawiyin. She called it the Qarawiyin Mosque. And this mosque was to become one of the crowning achievements of that part of Africa, that part of North Africa. Now what happened, so in 245, about 859 Hijri, so we're looking at the third century, the Qarawiyin Mosque in the northwest city of, of Fes in Morocco was established and it was from the money Fatima gave free to build the house of Allah. So the inheritance money that she had, she donated that as waqf, as an endowment, a, f uh, a payment, all or most of her money to get this mosque constructed and built. And in about two years before the building was actually finished, two years before the mosque was finished, two years before the mosque was finished, so about 857, the mosque was built about 859, Around 857, because of her piety and the way she was brought up, she began fasting continuously and will only stop until the final part of the mosque was built. So from 857 to 859, for two years, Fatima al-Fihri used to fast continuously out of ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Allah to accept it. For two years, she continuously fasted or she fasted regularly out of shukr to Allah that Allah makes this mosque happen and he realizes it. And when the, fast, when the last brick was put in, when the final part of the mosque <coughs> was put in, in 859, then she made the salah to Allah, salah to shukr. She thanked Allah for allowing her to do such a good thing, to build a mosque. And you might think, what's so special about this mosque? There are loads of mosques. What's so, what's so good about this one? Why are we even talking about her and this mosque in Morocco? It's not even here in London. Yeah, what's that got to do with us? Well, my brothers, the, the point is this. This mosque began to have next to it, or built around it, small madrasas, or colleges, or schools. And the, the Muslim rulers at that time, the Umara, each used to help sponsor these madrasas around this mosque. So after Fatima al-Fihri passed away, where she set the foundations of this mosque, with little schools attached to it, it started to grow bigger and bigger. Within 70 years, probably even less, within 70 years or 50 years, this became the, one of the biggest learning centers <coughs> and what we, could, we would call universities in the whole of the Western Islamic lands, i.e. Spain, Morocco, all that part. In fact, it is the oldest university in the world. The oldest university was not Oxford. It was not Oxford. It wasn't even Al Azhar in Cairo. This even predates Al Azhar in Cairo. So Fatima Al Fihri, this woman, was the first person to establish the oldest university in the world. You might want to some of you go and tell your history teachers about this particular point. The oldest universities was not in Paris or in Oxford. It wasn't the Sorbonne or it wasn't Oxford. It was in Morocco. The Qarawiyin. The Qarawiyin uh, mosque, stroke madrasa, stroke university in Fez, in Morocco. 
this was the oldest award-granting university. So when you go to a university, inshallah, most of you, inshallah, will go, I see very young faces, you will get a, what they call a degree. A degree. You get a certificate, a shahada, telling you what subject you pass with what grade. <coughs> it's like a GCSE as well. And A-levels, you get grade, you get a certificate to say what grade you got. In the Qarawiyin Mosque University that Fatima al-Fihri founded, she established, this was the oldest award-giving educational institution in the world. And this university, this university, the, the Qarawiyin, the Jami'at al-Qarawiyin, the Qarawiyin University, was also special for another reason. If you see Morocco on the map, if I had a PowerPoint, maybe I could show you a map, but just try and picture Morocco in your head, North Africa. Now if you see Morocco, let's just say this is the part of Morocco, on top of Morocco, north of Morocco, you see Spain and Portugal. You can get from Morocco, the coast of Morocco, to Spain within a couple of hours. Yeah? Now, this mosque and university in Qarawiyin, in, 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 in Fez, in Morocco, became the educational bridge for Muslim culture in North Africa, Morocco, and European culture. It became a bridge. It became a bridge. It became like a corridor, something where it connects one country or, or culture and civilization to another culture and civilization. The many, many scholars that came to Al Qarawiyin in Morocco, many of them became great intellectual people that made Europe like it became later on. So for example, one of the um, scholars there, Muhammad al-Idris, he was one of the earliest people we know whose maps we still have. If you're a sailor at that time, there's no satnav. There's no satnav. You had to follow maps that people had to draw to get your bearings, where to go, north, east, west, south. And the Muslim scholars were one of the earliest people to draw maps. And these maps, especially by Muhammad al-Idris, who was in Morocco, in Fez, he was in the Qarawiyin, well, the, according to historical sources that we can interpret, his maps <coughs> were used by the European people in the time of the Renaissance, when they went to explore different countries. They call that in history the age of exploration. Some of you may even studied the 16th to the 19th century. The period where Europe went out into the world to conquer it, to find out what was going on. So Britain uh, went and conquered many parts of the world. France did, Spain did, Portugal did, even the Dutch. So all the European countries went out and explored the world. This is called the age of exploration. How did they get on these ships and move around the world? Well, they used the maps the Muslims drew. And these maps were found and housed in Morocco. Other places as well, like Baghdad and Al-Andalus and places like that, but in Morocco as well. So this university, the books left by the Muslim scholars there were used by Europeans. Were used by Europeans. So what Fatima al-Fihri actually did was she established a mosque stroke university, mini university, that became the educational center of the Western Islamic world. And this educational center became a bridge into Europe. It became an interactive bridge into Europe. They tried it, the Muslims started to transfer their culture into Europe. Whatever they had learned, uh, even non-Muslims used to come to al Qarawiyin and learn, enroll and learn. Because the Muslims at that time we were, alhamdulillah, very advanced in our educational uh, sort of position. We were the uh, guardians of knowledge. We were the guardians of knowledge. Of course, it's the reverse now. We're not the guardians of knowledge at the moment. So, at that time, the whole world would come to the Islamic cities to learn, learn the sciences, chemistry, biology, astrology, astronomy, physics, philosophy, theology, language, you know, all these sciences, people used to come and learn geography at the Islamic institutions, and one of them then being the most important, Al-Qarawiyin. So what Fatima al-Fihri actually did 
was establish something that became so great so quickly that it became an engine for the European non-Muslims in Europe to help them in their development and their intellectual development as a continent. Yeah. Another person who was very, very famous, some of you may have heard of Ibn Khaldun. Anyone ever heard of Ibn Khaldun? Okay, can anyone have a guess who he might be? Okay. He was the? Definitely he was one of the greatest sociologists, someone who studies society and what makes up society in the medieval period. He was one of the very, very first scholars who, who set out a philosophy of history, how to study history. When you study history at school, um, there's a way you study history. You look at evidences, sources, why did someone do this, why did this happen, why did that war happen? Ibn Khaldun uh, put down a theory or a philosophy of how to study history and why things happen. He was a sociologist, you're right, an anthropologist. He studied societies and people. Why do people behave the way they do? Why do societies have uh, live the way that they do? Why do they have certain things in them and other societies don't have certain things in them? Why is one society one way, another society another way? Ibn Khaldun studied, studied and lived in Fez. He studied in, in the Qarawiyyi, in the university built by Fatima al-Fihri. And his books on sociology, anthropology, philosophy of history influenced the 17th, 18th, 19th century Western study of these subjects. In fact, a lot of modern day historians say Ibn Khaldun is perhaps the greatest the greatest sociologist or philosophy of, philosopher of history ever. And he was from al qarawiyyin And his books are still studied t today, even, you know, till this day. And there are many translations done on it as well. And it's interesting how Ibn Khaldun recognizes Fatima al-Fihri. And he says about her, he says about her, he says, it's as though Fatima al-Fihri, this woman, this noble woman, this pious woman, this pious young woman, it's as though she got all the kings after her, energized them after her into doing all the great stuff that they did. It's as though her building the Qarawiyin Mosque woke everyone up, woke all the rulers up after her in order to make this even bigger, to realize that this was an amazing project that she did. It's as if what she done has, you know, spurred and encouraged everyone after her. So this woman, this young woman who established this mosque that became the oldest university in the world, that was a bridge, a cultural and intellectual bridge into Europe, is one of the crowning achievements, really, of that time. It is uh, really a, a wonderful achievement of a human being who's Muslim to establish an institution like that. that uh, still today, people study in the Qarawiyyin. It's got that high status. So, this, in a nutshell, is uh, her biography, her life, because the sources are very scant, and her major achievement that she established this mosque in uh, Fez in Morocco uh, called the Qarawiyin in 859, 245 roughly, and uh, Hijri. So uh, this was and is still today one of the, uh, you could say, lasting legacies, educational, cultural legacies um, of the Muslim world. The now on to what is it then, what's so important and significant about Fatima al-Fihri and her establishing the oldest university in the world? What is it that we can reflect and learn from her, her legacy, what she left behind? You know, the obvious things we can observe is that she was a woman. She was a woman. She was very rich. She was very rich. She was from a very high social class. Yeah. She was pious. She was charitable, I mean, she gave all her money. And, um, of course, she will be rewarded for that by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what she started. 
But I want to mention three things that we ought to reflect on very seriously. Three things, amongst many others, but three I want to really focus your attention on. The first is this. Fatima al-Fihri establishes a university. Yeah? Now think about that. And think about now the times that we're living in. Especially the young girls, our sisters out there. You know, we, the young girls, are given a vision in life, a kind of aim in life, that really only talks about their physical beauty and what they own. Girls today are given a vision in life that all that matters really is how you look, your physical beauty and what you own, what you have. So the physical beauty, you know, like orange tans, you know, like tangerines, yeah, <laughs> you know, lying on a sunbed or putting a fake lotion on, you know, the body size, the perfect body size, whatever it is, six, eight, whatever it is, <laughs> you know, your designer labels, you know, these kind of physical things. And the other thing they're told, or young girls are sort of pushed, the vision they're pushed, is you have a, a you, it's all about your personal pleasure. It's all about having a good time, partying, falling over in the street drunk, you know, all these kind of things. It's all about your happiness, your personal pleasure. It's all about you feeling good. It's all about looking good, feeling good. And this is the vision really given to the young girls. Especially in our times now, in, through advertisement, through soaps, through films, through dramas, whatever way, books, magazines, everything. Whatever you pick up, whatever you see, whatever you hear, <coughs> it's all geared towards teaching you know, young girls, especially young women, about looks and you know, physical beauty and about personal pleasure. Fatima al-Fihri, may Allah be ple uh, have mercy on her, she had a broader vision. She was young. Her broader vision was, how can I make my society and my community better? How can I make my society and my community better? Yeah, I'm a rich woman. I'm a young woman. Allah's given me health. She's given me money. She's given me status. How can I use this for the betterment of my people, my community? Look at the maturity in that thinking. Look at the maturity in that thinking. Her vision was beyond how you look and what you own. It was more geared towards how can I make the future better for the people I'm living with. How can I preserve Islamic learning and Islamic practice? How can I preserve ibadah and ilm? How can I preserve ibadah, worshipping Allah, and knowledge, ilm? This is what she was thinking about. How can I preserve the Islamic culture? This is the deep vision that she had. That's the mature, broad, deep vision that she had. And she donated, of course, all her money towards that aim. She sacrificed all her money as a waqf, as an endowment for this aim. For this aim. Purely out of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first point. In an age where we're pumped with messages about physical beauty and it's about what you own, your cars and your handbags and all, all the rest of it, and about p p pursuing your personal pleasure, Fatima al-Fihri's vision was how do I make my community better and a community that worships Allah and preserves knowledge. Look at the difference between the two. The second point, the second point that I want to mention about Fatima, a, a, an observation or a lesson that we can learn from her life, there is a common misconception, and this is still banded around in the media, is that Muslim women made no substantial contribution to their own civilization. They were in the houses, no one knew who they were, no one ever saw them, yeah? They were just rolling bread for their husbands, cooking it in the house, getting their fingers burnt, and that was it. There's all men running the society. There's all men running the society. Well, this example of Fatima al-Fihri, may Allah have mercy on her, completely shatters this. And we're talking about 200, 200 years after the Prophet. So it's early, early period of Islam. We're not talking about 100 years ago. We're not talking about 200 <coughs> years ago. We're not talking about 300. We're talking about over 1,000 years ago. We're talking about over 1,000 years ago. A young woman with her sister. Remember, her sister established the Al-Andalus Mosque in Fez as well. So it's not just her by herself. 
There are many women like her, perhaps whose records we don't have. Maybe they'll be discovered in the future. But this shows that it is false that Muslim women cannot be part of their society in, in the public space. This proves false that Muslim women can't be entrepreneurs, can't go out and become businesswomen. They can't trade, they can't buy and sell, they can't contribute in the society. This completely undermines this. And it completely undermines the idea that Muslim women, their dress code stops them from becoming a member of the society. This example, Fatima al-Fihri, who was covered, and the Muslim society, the women used to cover. This completely proves the idea false, that you need to take off your headscarf in order to be an active member of your society. So this idea in the West that Muslim women are mute, they have no voice in Islamic history, they didn't do anything, they weren't teachers, they weren't scholars, they weren't businesswomen, they weren't, how we don't know anything about them, this is completely false. It's completely false. This is a misconception about Islamic history and culture. So, Fatima al-Fihri was allowed to travel from Tunisia to Morocco, travel around in her locality without any hindrance. There's nothing from the Sharia preventing her from trading and doing commerce, setting up a bit her, her businesses. How does someone set up a university without talking to people? How can you set something up without interacting with people? It's impossible. No, 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 you, you know, there was no remote communications at that time. I would just sit in my house and at the press of a button I'll communicate with everyone. No, she had to go out there, speak to people, get stuff done, order materials. You know, it's so, it's unthinkable that she not be an active member of a society. So, this completely proves the idea false that Muslim women were really people who were sidelined in their own societies and men dominated everywhere. So from this, women, this point, women, especially Muslim, especially Muslim women, should feel emboldened, empowered and proud of the Islamic values. That this is what Islam allows, before even Europe recognized women as being fully human. These rights were given to women and women enjoyed that freedom under Islam. Because the Sharia allowed it. So we should be, uh, feel very uh, proud of our culture and our heritage. That our deen really is about human flourishing, making society better. Making society better. The third point I want to mention, I will conclude with this. Fatima al-Fihri's life, may Allah have mercy on her, should make us think, should prompt us to think as Muslims about how we can take her example and contextualize it for our own personal lives. Especially the Muslim sisters. How do we make our lives relate to what she did? Really, we should think about that. Our purpose in life really isn't just about a car's career and companionship. You know, the three C's. Yeah, having a car, having a career and meeting someone. Yes, these things are part of life, to own these things. But they're not the ultimate purpose in life. What Fatima al-Fihri's life should make us think about, her sacrifice, her extreme charity, her piety, her active engagement, her hard work, all this should make us think about that, you know, I want to be someone who wants to make my society better. In fact, I want to be someone who wants to make the world better. Fatima al-Fihri made her society, her locality better. We should be thinking, how can I be someone who wants to change my society that I live in and wants to even change the world to make it a better place to live in? To make it a better place to live in. To make it a place. To make it a place that made Fatima al-Fihri the woman, the young woman she was. To make her the young, mature, intellectual, pious woman she was. We must think about how we can become people who, would, who want to change our societies into a society that will allow religiosity, will allow flourishing, will allow betterment of, human, uh, of all human beings. Stop, uh, educationally, materially, spiritually, religiously, in all these aspects. A society that makes more of a kind of person of Fatima al-Fihri. And this is an Islamic society. This is an Islamic society. Only an Islamic society can ensure these values are preserved. Not just for people who are Muslims, but non-Muslims as well. And this is really, my dear brothers, I want you to think about. From Fatima al-Fihri's life, how can I take that lesson and, 
and put it into my context here. How can I make my society better and even make the world a better place? To live in a world that Fatima al-Fihri lived in. And that world was un a world under Islam. Under the sacred Sharia, under the Sharia of Islam. This is the kind of society we want to li live in. And so these are at least three lessons, broad lessons or observations we can uh, take about Fatima al-Fihri's life. And so I really urge you all to think about it, uh, to think about what she's done. Go study the Qarawiyyin, go study the history of what this university, how it was established and what it's about. This is part of our history. So really we, could, we uh, should uh, ponder over this. And I really want to end with a hadith uh, that's Hassan. It's great, Hassan by the Muhaddithun. And Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he said, that in mimma yalhaqu al-mu'min min amalihi wa hasanatihi ba'da mawtihi ilman allamahu wa nasharahu waladan salihan tarakahu aw mushafan warathahu aw masjidan banahu aw baytan li ibn al-sabil banahu aw naharan ajrahu aw sadaqatan akhrajahu min malihi fi sihhatihi wa hayatihi talhaquhu min ba'da mawtihi Abu Huraira radiallahu an, he says in a hadith that there are good deeds that will reach a believer even after his, his death. There are certain types of actions if you do, even after you die, the action will follow you to come to find you. The action will come to find you. And one of them, he says, is ilman allamahu wa nasharahu, knowledge that you learn and you talk to others. So if you learn knowledge, and you teach it to others, that will be an action that will, you'll keep getting reward for and it will look for you even after you die. And for those of us who are parents, if we leave a very pious son after we die, and that son makes a dua for us and becomes a good person, that reward will be with you even after you die. The second one, O Mus'hafan Warathahu. Or if you give a copy of the Qur'an for people to read, like let's say you buy a Qur'an and you donate it to the mosque. Anyone now who reads that Mus'haf, that Qur'an, you will get that reward of everyone who reads from that Qur'an until Yawm al -Qiyam. And that reward will go to you even after you die, to help you. وَمَسْجِدًا banahu, And a mosque that is built from like charity and, and you, from your own money. That's what Fatima al fihri <coughs> she did. She built that mosque and university. وَبَيْتًا لِبْنِ السَّبِيلِ بَنَاهُ Or if you build um, a house for a traveller that they can stay in on their travels. Or أَوْ نَهْرًا أَجْرَاهُ Or you dig a canal so people can benefit from the water. You dig a canal so people can benefit from that water. وَصَدَقَةً أَخْرَجَهُ مِنْ حَيَاتِهِ or if you uh, give charity during your lifetime, sadaqah during your lifetime, while you are alive and in good health. These are the amal, these are the actions that will follow you even after you die. You get the reward even after you die. Because everyone who benefits from it and thanks Allah for it, you will get the reward for it. So brother, this is just, a, some, this is just something to think about regarding Fatima al-Fihri. And uh, I wonder that they are the Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and Jazakum Al Khair, and Ahsan Al Jazakum.